mistake made here is to mistake a simulation for the thing simulated. Uh, we don't make that mistake for anything else. I mean, I, nobody would mistake a kidney function simulation on a computer for a kidney producing urine. It seems almost impossible to think, though, that we could ever reproduce or have a control group with consciousness. Um, and that, I think, leads many people to think about uh, maybe philosophically entertaining, but ultimately, you know, impractical sorts of experiments. I mean, are you aware of any, you know, true experiments that could shed a light, uh, no pun intended, on consciousness as a, uh, other than, you know, kind of metaphorically the dashboard, the, the instrument panel of yours, et cetera? Are there only Gedanken experiments or can we actually do real uh, honest to goodness experiments in the physical sciences? I think we can. I think neuroscience has been showing that experimentation around awareness, uh, phenomenality, consciousness itself is possible and it's productive to a large degree. Um, the entire field of uh, um, the neuroscience of consciousness, the notion of the neural correlates of consciousness is based on measurement and uh, subjective reports, individuals who report what they are experiencing. Now, are there problems with that? Are there uh, limitations? Surely there are. Um, for instance, uh, when you are basing your study on reportability, you do not distinguish between raw consciousness or phenomenal consciousness, as we say it, on the one hand, and on the other hand, meta-consciousness or, or, or conscious metacognition, which goes on top of awareness. It's meta-consciousness -conscious, is what you have when in addition to experiencing, you know that you experience. Mm. Now, to report an experience, you have to be meta-conscious of it. Otherwise, you will say, well, I'm not having that experience. Well, in fact, <laughs> you may be experiencing it. So right. there is that limitation. The neuroscience, neuroscientists today try to get around that with the so-called no report paradigms. But then you get limited in all kinds of other ways. But I think it is productive to, to have some science around uh, phenomenality, around consciousness. What we will not succeed, and unfortunately, that seems to be the goal for most sciences uh, around consciousness, is to reduce consciousness to physiological brain activity, to, to, to neurometabolism. Uh, the, the, the very attempt to do that presupposes a certain metaphysical assumption, which is that, well, consciousness is reducible and that the correlation between brain activity and consciousness is a causal one. And that, that I think is hopeless. Um, and to complement the neuroscience of consciousness, I think the way to go is to, um, to have introspective investigation, which is not science. We should not add introspection to science because it will break the back of science's horse and we will lose a very, very useful horse that we should keep and protect and maintain healthy. Um, but in addition to science, I think it would be very productive, even for the scientists who practice the science of consciousness, to develop a little more sophisticated uh, introspective awareness, to know a little bit more firsthand what it is that they are actually studying. Because the level of introspective naivete amongst philosophers of mind and, and neuroscientists of consciousness is sometimes scary. It's, uh, it's, it's, um, it's soaring. Because why? why? Why do you say that? Well, because you, one is dedicating one's life to studying consciousness, which can mm. only be actually known from introspection, a first-person perspective. Uh, but one is extremely naive about what that word means. So how can one study it from the outside if one doesn't actually know what one is studying? I mean, there are attempts uh, made by famous uh, neuroscientists who say that, uh, and I quote, consciousness doesn't happen. Consciousness doesn't exist. Um, and when you read their material, what you realize is that what they call consciousness is a kind of ethereal sense of individual subjectivity, a, a kind of individual I within, a kind of soul or spirit. Mm. And, and that's what they explain away. Well, very good. It's, it's not like anybody was waiting for, for that kind of proof of the obvious, but uh, they confuse that with what philosophers call phenomenal consciousness, which has nothing to do with individual identity or some kind of individual soul. It's about experience itself, phenomenality. It's a, it's a type of existence that is defined in terms of qualities as opposed to quantities. You cannot specify or fully describe 
experiences uh, on, on the basis of physical quantities. What is the length in centimeters of a thought? What is the weight in kilograms of an emotion? What is the color of, of a memory? I mean, um, th that's where things go wrong when a, you know, otherwise famous neuroscientist makes proclamations about the ability to reduce consciousness to nothing, while in fact what he's referring to as consciousness is not, <laughs> is not consciousness at all. I think that is, that is unfortunate and a little more introspective insight would, would improve and help everybody to engage in a more productive dialogue. Mm. So uh, I, I think it is, uh, it is useful to kind of maybe for the audience to kind of state <clears throat> some of your positions, which I'll summarize, at least as I understand them, but please correct me if I'm wrong in the likely scenario that I'm wrong. But as far as I understand it, you are not, uh, although you are materialistic in some sense, you don't believe that computers will ever be able to approach the uh, uh, conscious experience or, or even the the thought process uh, that humans can engage in. Is is that correct? Am I summarizing your, your position? Mm -hmm. or? I'm not a materialist. Uh, okay, mm -hmm. not at all. I, I don't think that uh, the foundational level of nature is material or physical or describable in terms of quantities at all. I don't think that is true. Um, I am very skeptical of the notion that one can build a silicon computer and expect it to have private conscious in their life the way you and I have. Because when you talk about conscious computers, what we mean is more than just the fact that there is consciousness associated with it. Mm. What we mean is that a computer would be conscious in the same way as you and I are. In other words, a computer would have private conscious states that are accessible from the inside, but not from the outside. Yes. That I think is a very unproductive fantasy hmm. that arises from some silly psychology because nature is telling us that uh, what private conscious inner life looks like when observed from the outside is warm, moist neurochemistry. <laughs> That's what it looks like. So why would a silicon computer that you know, doesn't metabolize, doesn't burn ATP, doesn't release neurotransmitter molecules, uh, doesn't have action potentials. Well, we can imitate action potential, so that's not a good example, but doesn't have any of the rest. Why would that be what private conscious in their life looks like? It's completely arbitrary. Mm. The mistake made here is to mistake a simulation for the thing simulated. Uh, we don't make that mistake for anything else. I mean, I, nobody would mistake a kidney function simulation on a computer for a kidney producing urine. Nobody would expect a computer to pee on one's desk because one knows that a kidney simulation, even if accurate down to the molecular level, is not the thing simulated. But when it comes to the patterns of, uh, of mental activity in a human being, we think the simulation is the thing simulated. And that's extraordinarily, extraordinarily naive. No, I don't think any silicon mm -hmm. computer will ever have private conscious in their life. 